What's going on guys? So in today's video, we'll be looking at the alternative facts recently put out by ESPN's Katie Nolan from a segment on her talk show where she attempts to make a case for why WNBA players deserve a larger share of their league's revenue. Now the reason for this video is to show how far many of these sports personalities are willing to go to push a specific narrative and to also encourage you guys to be free thinkers and to continue to use empirical data and facts in their proper context to come to logical conclusions on different topics. So let's get started. Uh, anyone, anyone can make the argument that a younger, smaller, less popular league can't pay the same amount as the NBA. What's harder is arguing they can't pay the same percentage which is what WNBA players are trying to tell you. One big issue is that unlike the NBA, it's tough to find any solid financial numbers for the women's league. We don't really know how much money they have or where it's coming from. Now, while Katie Nolan is correct in stating that WNBA players would like a comparable percentage of league revenue to their male counterpart, she is incorrect in stating that it's tough to find any solid numbers for the women's league. In fact, the financial numbers for the WNBA are known to many of its players. When the Huffington Post wrote a piece on the 19th of September trying to also make a case for equal pay, a WNBA spokesperson reached out to the paper after the article had been published to specifically let them know that the WNBA had lost significant money every year and has shared its financials with the Players Association, which includes five-time All-Star and 2016 WNBA MVP Neka Agumake, 11-time All-Star and 3-time WNBA Champion Sue Bird, 5-time All-Star and 2015 WNBA MVP Elena Del Don, as well as many others. So now the question becomes, why doesn't the WNBA's Players Association make their league's financials public like the NBA does? The obvious answer is that the Players Association is embarrassed of the financial numbers it's been shown since it is a known fact that the WNBA is not nor has ever been profitable as a league. But when players ask for a bigger cut, the most common refrain is, we don't have the money. Like Adam Silver said on Get Up back in April, ultimately this isn't a Title IX issue, it's a business issue. We still have a number of teams losing money. And if the teams in the league aren't making a profit, they can't possibly pay the players a whole bunch of money like they do in the NBA. Nearly half of NBA teams are losing money. And then even if you factor in revenue sharing, nine of the 30 were in the red. Huh. So a number of NBA teams are losing money every year for sure. And a number of WNBA teams might be losing money every year, we think. And yet only one of those is readily accepted and talked about all the time. I, wo I wonder why that is. Now in this clip, while Katie Nolan is correct in referencing an article showing that nine NBA teams did operate at a loss in 2016, what she conveniently left out was that the article also stated that in spite of this, the 21 other teams more than made up for the loss by bringing the total combined earnings of all 30 teams at more than $530 million in net income. So while certain NBA teams did operate at a loss, it did not affect the overall collective or the league's profitability. Fasting forward to this past year, Forbes' NBA team valuations for 2018 not only showed that all 30 NBA teams were now worth at least $1 billion, but also that the only NBA team to operate at a loss this past season was the Cleveland Cavaliers. And when all of that is juxtaposed to the WNBA, there are major differences. Now as we've already stated, a WNBA spokesperson has confirmed that the league has lost significant money every year and has shared its financials with the Players Association. This of course is in line with Adrian Wojnarowski, who is Katie Nolan's colleague at ESPN, reporting that David Stern had authorized a $12 million subsidy to the WNBA in 2003. Then the Boston Globe reported in 2006 that the WNBA was actually receiving $12 million as a yearly allowance from the NBA, which explains why WNBA teams were continuously able to operate at a loss year after year to the tune of $1.5 to $2 million as was reported by USA Today in 2007. Then in 2016, 
The New York Times reported that half of the WNBA teams were losing money, and since then, not one WNBA team has reported profitability in 2017 or 2018. And a number of WNBA teams might be losing money every year, we think. So the fact that Katie Nolan can utter these words not only shows her lack of objectivity in regards to the topic at hand, but also that she has not done any actual research. So in going back to the original point made, the reason why the NBA is never talked about for having certain teams operate at a loss like the WNBA is because the NBA is still able to be highly profitable and generate billions of dollars in spite of these losses, while the WNBA has not displayed the ability to be profitable even once in its 22 years of existence. But look, I kinda get it. If a league has been around for 22 years, and it only has 12 franchises, some of which still aren't profitable, and attendance is under 7,000 fans per game, you gotta shut it down and move on, right? You tried, it just didn't work out. Okay, so who's gonna tell the NBA? Because those are their numbers from their 22nd year. The WNBA is actually better off with higher attendance and a TV deal. Now before breaking down this clip, what must first be mentioned is that the NBA was formed in August of 1949 through a merger between the Basketball Association of America and the National Basketball League, making the 1949-50 season the first official NBA season and the 7071 season its 22nd year in existence. And as we now look at this graphic, which highlights the attendance of both leagues in their 22nd year, there are two points to mention. One being that the NBA, contrary to what Katie Nolan stated, was attracting more crowds to their games in their 22nd year than the WNBA is now, which shows that Katie Nolan either lied on camera or did not do any research. And second, the NBA's attendance average during the 1970-71 season of 7,648 was its highest up to that point, and as the graphic shows, the NBA was on an upwards trajectory. While the WNBA's attendance has not only been on the decline ever since the league was formed, but its attendance average for the 2018 season was their lowest of all time. And this is in spite of the fact that the WNBA literally gives away free tickets to both regular season and playoff games. So while the NBA was growing in popularity in its 22nd season, the WNBA has been doing the exact opposite. In fact, when the WNBA's lack of profit is taken into account, along with their all-time lowest attendance average and the fact that six teams have already folded, common sense would say that these are nothing but clear signs that the league is slowly going out of business. Now in regards to the second part of Katie Nolan's comment about the WNBA also having a TV deal, something the NBA did not have in the 1970s, that statement is also untrue. The NBA not only had a television contract as far back as the 1950s, but if we were to solely focus on the 1970-71 season, the NBA had just renewed its television contract with ABC that season by signing a three-year $17 million contract, which was a $4 million per year increase from their previous deal. What must also be made clear about the WNBA's current television contract is that it is only possible because the NBA works it into its own contract with the other networks. Look, if they want the league to succeed, and they keep saying they do, they need to invest in it. And a great place to start would be giving the players a percentage of revenue that is comparable to the other professional leagues in the US. So according to Katie Nolan, a great place to start in helping the WNBA succeed would be for its owners to invest in it even further by giving the players a higher percentage of revenue. But how exactly does that correlate to better television ratings and higher attendance? Something the WNBA has always struggled with in spite of having the best female talent in the world. The obvious answer is that it won't because both television ratings and attendance are a direct reflection of the product. And what Katie Nolan and many who share in her opinion don't seem to understand is that there is a vast difference between having the best talent in the world and having the best female talent in the world. 
the best basketball talent has and will always continue to reside in the NBA, which is why WNBA players should only be given a percentage of revenue that is comparable to their own league's profit margin and not one that is comparable to other men's leagues. Now the Mystics, by the way, you mentioned the arenas. The Mystics will be playing at George Mason's facility for the first yes. couple of games because Capitol Arena is under renovations. Now, I'm someone who grew up in the D.C. area, and almost every sports team played outside of the actual district mm -hmm. during that time, so that's not that unusual. Now, in this bonus clip, Rachel Nichols mentions the Washington Mystics not being able to play their two WNBA Finals games at Capital One Arena due to renovations. But upon further investigation, even that is found to be a lie. The real reason why the Washington Mystics couldn't play at Capital One Arena on September 12th and September 14th was because those days coincided with both Drake and Paul Simon performing there. As shown by the Ticketmaster website, as well as Capital One Arena's very own website. And because both concerts were going to bring in more revenue for Capital One Arena, they then took precedence over the Washington Mystics who had to relocate and play their games at George Mason University in Virginia. Now these are just a few examples where ESPN has allowed its employees to state alternative facts about the WNBA. But the more interesting question to someone like Katie Nolan would be to know if she's ever put those words into action and supported the WNBA by way of attendance. After all, her Instagram profiles shows her attending a Red Sox game, a Mets game, a Celtics game, a Bruins game, and even the Super Bowl. But not once is she ever seen at a WNBA game. In fact, if she's so supportive of the league, then why hasn't she had a WNBA player on her show yet to speak about how great the league is? Or why hasn't she donated part of her salary of over a million dollars a year as was reported by the New York Post, to help WNBA players with this pay issue if it's truly a cause she believes in. The answer to these questions would reveal that the WNBA's failure as a league, apart from its product, has also been because women like Katie Nolan have truly failed to support it. And by criticizing the owners for not further investing in the WNBA as a league, all Katie Nolan has done is throw stones when she herself lives in a glass house. What can we do? How can we get these women a bigger chunk of that pie and get them paid? By growing the business. I mean, the, the, the WNBA players are still paid significantly more than the G League players, certainly the, the top players. But ultimately, this is not a Title IX issue. This is a business issue. Yeah. And, and we still have a number of teams losing money. I mean, I appreciate the support of ESPN. They've been great with the WNBA. You know, Lisa Borders, relatively new commissioner, she's doing a, a wonderful job. But, you know, we, we haven't figured out a winning formula, to be quite honest. I mean, there, we have a lot of empty seats in our buildings. The ratings have been decent on ESPN. It's been harder to get people um, to come to the games. It may be because the games are in the summer. One of the things we're talking about, do we need to shift to the so-called more natural basketball season, sort of in the fall and winter? That may be part of the issue. I, I, I'm particularly frustrated that we've been unable to get young women, girls, to attend those games. It's interesting, women's basketball is largely supported just in terms of demographics by older men, for whatever reason, who like fundamental basketball. And, and it's something I've talked a lot to the players about, and, and including Rebecca, when she was a player, she was active in the union and now on television. It's that we're not connecting with almost the same demographic that our players are. I'm always saying our players are roughly, let's say, you know, 21 to 34 in, in that age range. I'm saying, why do you think it is that we're not getting your peers to want to watch women's basketball? So I, in a way, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good problem to have in that 
I think the, the game looks fantastic, and it's, it's amazing where the league now is from over 20 years ago when it launched. But we still have a marketing problem, we're, we're, and we've got to figure it out. We've got to figure out how we can do a better job connecting to young people and to get them to be interested in women's basketball.